Hello, and welcome to our 23rd annual Gene S. Marks Memorial Education Forum. My name is Josh Marks, and I'm the CEO of a Medical Service Company. Like in years past, today's event offers sessions from highly regarded healthcare professionals spanning the nation. We are honored to provide this premier education event in the sleep, respiratory, nutrition, and diabetes care disciplines for some of the most important healthcare heroes in our communities, you. We have an action-packed day for you with 13 distinguished speakers from universities, health systems, and supporting organizations. Before we get going, let me give you a quick lay of the land for today's program. This morning, we'll have three one-hour long education sessions leading up to our keynote presentation. New to this year's program is our nutrition and diabetes track that runs concurrently with our morning combined sleep and respiratory sessions. Then after a 30 minute break, the sleep and respiratory disciplines will split into two tracks. Throughout each session, you can submit your questions under the Engage tab just above the presentation screen. Speakers will address questions following their presentations as time allows. Sessions have been approved by the appropriate accrediting body for continuing education credits. Now, towards the end of each session, you will see a pop-up on your screen inviting you to evaluate the session and speaker. If you miss the pop-up or wish to fill out the evaluation later, simply click the blue button called Check and Survey, located on the screen above the name of the presentation. At the end of the day, you'll be able to download your certificate from within the conference site. For any technical support, you can email us at jsmceu at medicalserviceco.com. Before we kick things off, I'd like to thank all our speakers, sponsors, and DME partners. Sponsors, thank you for your support of this event. We would have a very difficult time offering this type of event without your support. We all have a choice of who we do business with please consider these manufacturers and suppliers. They clearly believe in the DME channel and investing in home care. DME partners, it's inspiring to see us band together for the benefit of our patients and our partners. Today, we are all one team. Because of the valuable information being shared by our world-renowned speakers, we will be better equipped to care for the millions of Americans with home care needs. One more thing. Before each session, you're going to hear a little bit more about MSC from a few of our team members. To learn more about anything you hear and how we can support you and your patients, visit medicalserviceco.com. Now, let the forum begin. Good morning and welcome to the Sleep and Respiratory Series of our 23rd Annual Jean S. Marks Memorial Education Forum. I have the honor of introducing our first speaker of the day, Dr. Sashil Patil. Dr. Patil is the incoming system director and section chief for sleep medicine at the University Hospitals of Cleveland. He has completed his residency and chief residency in internal medicine at UH before pursuing fellowship training at John Hopkins University in pulmonary and critical care medicine, during which he also completed training in sleep medicine. Dr. Patil also received a PhD in clinical investigation at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He is board certified in sleep medicine as well as pulmonary and critical care medicine. Dr. Patil has been active in numerous committees and leadership roles in the Sleep and Respiratory Neurobiology Assembly and board of directors for the American Thoracic Society, the American Sli Academy of Sleep Medicine and the American College of Chess Physicians. He has organized or spoken in numerous scientific symposiums at their international meetings related to sleep medicine and has participated in the development of important clinical guidelines in the sleep field. He is the author of more than 30 publications and has been given invited lectures throughout the U.S. He is a former program director for the ACGME Sleep Medicine Fellowship at John Hopkins. Dr. Patil has also been active in sleep medicine related public policy at the state level as a past president of the Maryland Sleep Society. Dr. Patil has longstanding research interest in the pathogenesis of obstruction sleep apnea, HIV and sleep disorders, aspects of portable monitoring for sleep testing, clinical trials and sleep apnea therapeutics, and the role of hospital-based testing. 
We hope you enjoyed Dr. Patil's lecture, What's in a Mask? How Mask Interface Affects Efficiencies of OSA Treatment. Please use the Engage tab to submit any questions for Dr. Patil, which will be answered during the live Q&A portion of today's lecture. To receive credit for attending, please complete and submit the evaluation at the conclusion of this session. Enjoy the presentation. Good morning, everyone, uh, and thanks for being present for this uh, talk. I was tasked with talking with you all about positive airway pressure and sleep disordered breathing. Does, does the interface matter? And really what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about the different roles of a full face mask versus nasal interfaces when treating obstructive sleep apnea. I, uh, in terms of potential conflicts of interest, I, I do some consulting for, for Primasun, um, and I have been on the ABIM pulmonary medicine exam writing committee, but those conflicts are not relevant to today's presentation. The objectives for this talk are to talk about, you know, and, and sure provide an understanding of why oronasal masks were developed for the treatment of sleep disordered breathing. We'll then describe potential issues in sleep disordered breathing outcomes when using oronasal masks versus nasal interface. And we'll start with a real world case example of the implications of the interface use. So <clears throat> this is a patient I saw uh, many years ago. Uh, this gentleman is a 79 year old person uh, who had presented with complaints of PAP intolerance. He was initially diagnosed with severe OSA about 10 years before I had seen him at an outside hospital. And then he was treated with CPAP and then uh, BiPAP for unclear reasons. He comes in now because he can't tolerate the BiPAP and says the pressures are just too high for him. And so he's not been using PAP too much. And his wife has noted worsening sleepiness and his upward score was, was 20. In terms of his past medical history, uh, you know, not too significant besides the sleep apnea, had high anal hernia, hypertension, an enlarged prostate and asthma. Um, he does have a family history of sleep apnea. His son has sleep apnea. He's, uh, you know, mild to moderately obese at a BMI of 34. His blood pressure is slightly elevated, um, but otherwise his airway exam was not particularly remarkable. And this slide just illustrates, you know, what the exam uh, sleep study findings were uh, that I had available when he first came to see me. And so in 2009, he had a test which showed that he had uh, uh, 77 episodes an hour, all considered obstructive apneas. It appears that CPAP of 12 resulted in a residual AHI of 12 episodes an hour. A, a few months later, he came back for a BiPAP titration, presumably because uh, he was noted to have this elevated residual. And he was titrated up to a setting of 23 over 19. And the residual AHI was 1.6 events uh, per hour. He had another uh, sleep study that was done in 2011. Um, this was done as another PAP titration study. And about half the night was done on CPAP and half the night on BiPAP. And on CPAP, they titrated up to 20. And he still had an elevated residual at about nine episodes an hour. So it appears they switched over to BiPAP. And at BiPAP 24 over 20, uh, you know, he seemed to have a, a normal AHI. And so this is the hypnogram uh, from that sleep study. And really what I want you to just take away from looking at this is, is that you can see from all of these tick marks that he's having a lot of sleep apnea events. These next two rows illustrated by my arrow just shows the increases in PAP pressure so CPAP was increased from four centimeters up to about 18 or 20 centimeters of water. And there's a re significant reduction in frequency, but there does appear to be some events. And it looks like here they went over to bi-level. 
Um, there were some events for a period of time, but at the end of the night, when he was at the the highest pressures that they tested at 24 over 20, it appears that he did not have any significant sleep apnea at that point. This is just the uh, a titration table if you like to look at numbers. And so you can see the AHI at each of the different pressure levels. And you see they do seem to improve once you get to a CPAP level of about 14. But then, you know, there's a lot of variability with um, with some uh, uh, some uh, residual sleep apnea despite the elevated pressures till you get to that 24 over 20. And, you know, this is his compliance at the time I, I, I saw him. Uh, you know, he was maybe using, you know, CPAP at least four hours a night for about 60% uh, of the days uh, that were listed here. You can't see the bars terribly well at the bottom. His BiPAP pressures had been reduced slightly to 20 over 16. You can see his residual AHI was still in that 10 to 15 range, similar to what his prior sleep studies was, was, was at. Um, but he really wasn't using it much uh, uh, more recently when I had seen him. And so he comes in and he says, you know, Doc, by the way, I hate the mask that they gave me. Can you get me one that's more comfortable? To which I then asked, well, what mask are you getting? And so he shows me what the mask is. And, you know, many of you will appreciate uh, this is a, this is a full face mask uh, that, that he was using that, that night. So I think it's interesting to then ask the question, you know, are oronasal masks as effective as nasal interfaces in, in treating obstructive sleep apnea? And there's a fair amount of literature here. You know, certainly in the titration setting in labs, you know, I often see that full face masks are used quite, quite frequently. And, you know, one of the questions I think it's worth asking ourselves is, well, why do we even think about it to begin with? You know, and these this lists some of those reasons. You know, one, you know, patient asks for it. You know, doc, I think I'm a mouth breather. So we say, okay, let's give you a full face mask. The other is that, you know, the patient clearly has nasal congestion, or maybe they tell you that they have nasal obstruction as the reason for being a mouth breather. So we think, oh, that must mean we can't use a nasal interface. Another is that this is just sort of culture. This is how I think we're trained as a, as a group sometimes. And we just think that a full face mask is going to be more comfortable for a patient than necessarily maybe testing different interfaces with them first. Um, we also might go to a full face mask because we see that the patient's having a lot of air leaks with a nasal interface. And maybe it's because those air leaks are causing other symptoms like conjunctivitis or skin abrasions or rhinitis, rhinorrhea, oral dryness, or the patient's just not able to keep their mouth closed. So we just want to make it easier for them and put them on an oronasal mask. So those are some, some reasons why we think about it. And what do we know in terms about effectiveness? And so this is a study uh, that was done by a mentor of mine uh, at Johns Hopkins uh, back in the early 80s, uh, Dr. Philip Smith. Um, and the purpose of this study was really actually to look at, you know, why the upper airway uh, uh, collapses. And so this was a CPAP titration, uh, uh, essentially. And you see these dashed lines which represent uh, uh, using a nasal mask and slowly increasing the pressure until airflow is normalized. And you see this curve here, which is a, a flow by pressure curve. And you see as pressure is increased, flow increases. Um, and you see for each of the six patients that were tested, you see that as pressure was increased through the nasal mask, flow was uh, uh, also increased and they were able to effectively open the upper airway. A sub-study that they did within this was to actually then switch over to a, a full face mask. And it's hard to see, but you'll see at the bottom of each of the graphs that there's a solid line here. And that solid line represents the full face mask condition. And the reason you're seeing it hovering at zero flow is because what they found during 
this study in this particular series of six patients was the patients continued to have obstructive apneas and they were unable to effectively open up the upper airway. Now, the only thing is they were only went up to a pressure of 10 centimeters of water. Um, so it's possible that if they'd gone to higher pressures, they might have been able to open up the airway and treat the patient. But I think it still makes the point that you don't need as much pressure, at least in these six patients, using a nasal mask as you might have needed with a full face mask. So again, very early study group of patients that had probably the most severe forms of obstructive sleep apnea. Um, this was the first study that was done by Mark Sanders out of the University of Pittsburgh, where they looked at using an oronasal mask for obstructive sleep apnea. And in fact, they showed the contrary to, to that uh, a study by Smith and colleagues, which was that they were able to show that they could treat sleep apnea with a full face mask. And I think this is sort of where the use of a full face mask started to become, become popular. And so what they did was uh, they did a study where they looked at 30 patients, where they had a successful uh, a, a titration. Um, you know, what they then did was to offer those patients a uh, oronasal mask. Um, if the patient then demonstrated intolerance uh, using a nasal interface, so mouth leaks, nasal congestion, obstruction, this is a group of patients that had you know, severe sleep apnea with an apnea index of 55 events per hour. They were moderately obese. And on the oronasal mask, uh, they were able to successfully reduce that down to under five episodes an hour. About half of this population ended up being uh, switched over to bi-level PAP rather than just staying on CPAP. And in two patients, they did a, a, small, a small intervention where they used a mouthpiece under the full face mask to keep the mouth open. And even though that they kept the mouth open, they were still able to demonstrate improvements in, in sleep apnea severity. So, so in this case, it looked like, well, hey, looks like a, there's no difference between a nasal interface and a full face mask. The authors did make an acknowledgement, uh, which is, is that, you know, even though there might appear to be equivalence between these two uh, um, modalities, um, there are theoretical concerns where you, why you might want to still look at using a nasal interface. And that's the concern of potential aspiration of, of mouth and gastric consequences and the potential increase in dead space that you can get with a full face mask. And so that still meant that you should think about a nasal interface at this time uh, uh, compared to a full face mask. These days, or nasal masks have leaks built into it to avoid the dead space issue. Um, and so this is maybe a little bit less of a concern than it was at that time. A study uh, in, in the same issue of, uh, of chest done by Rich Berry and colleagues down in University of Florida, uh, did a nested, uh, a two-stage uh, uh, sleep study. In the first study, what they did was to recruit patients with nasal obstruction, and they compared a night on full face mask to uh, the baseline night off of any form of PAP therapy. What they did note qualitatively was is that, you know, in these patients, that you know, awake oral breathing was more often seen than the nasal breathing. So giving you the sense that these were true oral breathers. Um, and when the patients were asleep, you know, 54% of the time there was some combination of oral nasal breathing that was being observed. Um, and you can see on the graph on the left hand side that with the full face mask again, that there was a reduction in the OSA severity with the full face mask. They then did a second uh, a study where they took patients that had acclimated to nasal CPAP, and they looked at the difference in residual AHI where they had one night on nasal CPAP and one night on full face mask CPAP. And what they, what they noted was that there was a similar residual AHI um, and that the pressure uh, requirements were about the same at about 13 centimeters of water and the residual sleep apnea rates were also, also similar. 
they also similarly noted that their study was not really designed to absolutely eliminate the possibility that these patients could be treated with nasal CPAP. But in this series of patients that they tested, there looked like there was equivalence uh, uh, between the two. So, you know, this really was the genesis of uh, introducing full face masks into the treatment of, of obstructive sleep apnea. You know, but that's not really the, the end of the story, I think. And I think it's useful to think about, you know, what happens when you deliver airflow both through the nose and the mouth versus only through the nose. And what's the effect on airway obstruction? Second thing is, you know, are there differences in pressure requirements when we use a full face mask versus a nasal interface? Those preliminary studies maybe suggest maybe there isn't. And what do we know about patient preference when we sort of introduce these, these, these modalities? So let's start with what's the effect on airway obstruction. So, you know, there are different mechanisms for why maybe in that first study by Smith et al., you know, why is it that a full face mask might theoretically have led to uh, inadequate treatment of obstructive sleep apnea? So what, if you think about it, if you have a full face mask that's on and it's anchored to the chin, you could potentially, if you're strapping things on too tightly, push the chin backwards. And if you're sleeping in the supine position, the chin could fall further back and make the airspace more narrow. The second is, is that because if the patient has the mouth open, you know, air pressure is being pushed into the mouth as well as the nose. And that could result in the soft tissue inside the oral cavity, i.e. the tongue and the soft palate being pushed back and occluding the airway. The third thing, and maybe something we don't think about as much, is just because one is wearing a full face mask, you're more likely than to keep your mouth open because you don't have to keep your mouth closed. Whereas with the nasal interface, you have to train yourself to keep your mouth closed. And what's known is, is that when you have your mouth open, is that anatomically, that's actually narrowing the posterior airspace. And if the airspace is narrow, that increases its likelihood that it's going to collapse. Another possibility is that because you're pushing air into both the nose and the mouth at the same time, that the position of the palate may not be in a favorable position and may narrow the airway. And that may result in a, a, a poor transmural pressure gradient. So all of these are reasons to potentially think about as, you know, why a full face mask might theoretically not be a good thing in treating obstructive sleep apnea. So is there actually any data to support some of these hypotheses? I'm going to show you a series of studies that sort of give some sense that some of this, that there is a basis for some of these principles. So this is a small study where they measured upper airway collapsability using a, a, a basically applying a, a negative suction pressure to the airway while people were awake and really trying to determine what the collapsing pressure was. And they looked at this under two conditions, one with the mouth open and then with the mouth uh, uh, closed. And what you'll see here is, is that in the mouth closed position that the airway collapsibility was more negative, meaning it's harder to collapse the airway compared to the mouth open position here. Um, and what you'll, uh, so what that is again, just confirming is that if your mouth is open, your airway is more collapsible. So in a published case study, this is further illustrated uh, in a patient that has ALS that had progressive respiratory failure, was on bi-level ventilation, and then transitioned to a home ventilator. Um, and what they noticed was that this patient was uh, using a full face mask. And on the first night, they just examined what was happening with that full face mask. And you'll see that the pressure settings were 16 uh, over four. Um, you know, the patient was sleeping reasonably well. The uh, residual AHI was quite elevated at about 34 events per hour. And the, uh, the patient was hypoventilating with a high carbon dioxide level. On the second night, <clears throat> they switched the patient over to a nasal interface. 
And what they were able to demonstrate is that they could use a lower pressure at 12 over four. And with that pressure setting, the residual AHI was down to two or three episodes an hour instead. And they had much more optimal control of the patient's ventilation with a reduction in the CO2 from 75 down to 55 millimeters of mercury. So really sort of sort of demonstrating, you know, you know, that the nasal interface in this patient was more effective. This is a video from that case that I'll play here. And if you look and concentrate, <clears throat> particularly just on the mouth area, and I want you to look just sort of above uh, where my uh, pointer is, this is sort of where the tongue is. And what you're gonna notice as I push play here is, is that as the mask sort of pushes off, off the person's face, which is inspiration, um, you'll notice that the tongue appears to be falling backwards. So just indicating that the, the airway pressure is pushing the tongue backwards and likely was the reason why they were not able to successfully treat the patient with the oronasal mask. And yet they were able to with the nasal mask instead. So this is another case study where what they did was they took a, a patient that was relatively uh, 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 thin to slightly overweight at BMI of 26 with severe sleep apnea, HI of 76. And uh, they did an endoscopy while the patient was, uh, was, under, uh, was sleeping or under sedation. Um, and they looked at what was happening to the tongue base and the, and the epiglottis, and they looked at the pressure requirements. And what they noted was that with the full face mask, this patient needed a pressure of 16 and still had a high residual AHI. But when you used a nasal mask, you know, only a pressure of seven was required, and they were able to successfully uh, treat uh, uh, the sleep apnea. And what they noted during endoscopy was, you'll notice that the epiglottis is sort of pushed anteriorly here, and the airspace is relatively small under the full face mask condition, whereas if you compare it to the nasal mask condition, the epiglottis is more posterior. You can see the vocal cords here. The airway is more open, making it easier to keep things open. So that shows you sort of anatomically what could be happening here. In another uh, uh, imaging study, what they did was during wakefulness, they applied uh, CPAP at 15 centimeters of water via a nasal mask and then via a full face mask. And they looked at the cross-sectional area of the retropalatal airspace and the retroglossal airspace, as you see here on the slides. And what you'll notice just in this particular patient is, is that the airspace, this is under the nasal CPAP condition, and then this is under the oronasal condition where you can see that the airspace looks uh, smaller than what you would expect under the nasal condition. When you actually look across the, a series of patients that they then tested using this approach, you'll see under the nasal mask that the size of the airway at these different levels was generally higher compared to when you used an oronasal mask with the mouth uh, open. If you kept the mouth closed while breathing on a oronasal mask and had them force them to breathe through their nose, the airspace was, was larger. So I think what this study sort of tells you is, is that what people do is, is that they tend to keep their mouth open when they have an oronasal mask. And the natural result of that is that the cross-sectional area tends to be small. And when it's small, it's gonna be more, more collapsible. <clears throat> the next couple of studies I'm gonna show you is from a group uh, in, in Brazil. And these are some, uh, these are some I think, elegant studies which are, are, which are worth uh, uh, looking at if you have the time. And so this first study uh, is, the, is where they looked at about 18 patients, and they're looking at the effect of breathing on residual sleep apnea events. And they used a mask uh, that was, uh, had, was a full face mask, but they could compartmentalize the breathing into nasal and oral breathing. 
And they could then actually force the patient to either breathe only through the nose or through the uh, nose and the mouth, or just through the mouth and see what would happen. And what they then did was to look at sleep apnea events and how it related to when patients were breathing exclusively through their nose or exclusively through their mouth. And they also did nasal endoscopy during midazolam induced sleep uh, to look at some other, other factors. And so, you know, one of the things that, that you'll see in the graph over here is, is that this dashed line kind of represents above which is nasal breathing and below which that they call predominantly oral breathing. And during periods of, of stable breathing that they saw during two minute trials of breathing, patients only had stable breathing when they were breathing only through, through their nose um, during the sedation uh, uh, condition. You know, when patients uh, began to have disordered breathing events, the disordered breathing events really began to occur most commonly when the patients were predominantly oral breathing, and that might have been either hypopneas or apneas. You know, when they were nasal breathing, uh, you would not see these events nearly as much as when there was there was oral oral breathing uh, occurring. Uh, two patients with oronasal and four patients with the oral mask had residual events, even when they were titrated up to a pressure of 20 centimeters of water. And the average pressure requirements for those that were using a full face mask tended to be two or three centimeters of water higher than those that were uh, when they were treated with a nasal mask instead. This shows you the results of the endoscopy portion of the study where they looked at the size of the size of the airway when they're breathing through the nasal route or both the oronasal route or only through the oral route. And you can see when exclusively just breathing through the oral route that the airspace looks relatively small compared to the other two conditions. And the nasal route really appears to be the best. When you look at it across all patients you see, you know, in the aggregate, that really that the airspace is largest under the nasal condition compared to the other two uh, uh, conditions. So really emphasizing that nasal breathing is, is, is really an important route of breathing. You know, they followed up this study a few years later where they looked at, you know, they took a group of patients that were uh, chronic oronasal mask users, presumably because they were, they were mouth breathers, uh, whereas in the first study, they were unselected patients. And <clears throat> in these 13 patients that had, uh, you know, severe sleep apnea, again, mild obesity, what you'll see, uh, you know, in this one uh, example is that uh, they took patients, they put them uh, 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 to sleep using midazolam, and they again used their compartmentalized mask model with an endoscope uh, 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 present in the airway. And what they did was they did first look at titrating using either the oronasal mask first and then moving to the nasal mask and they would randomize the order. And then they looked at what happened with stable airflow limitation, you know, when they created that by lowering the PAP pressure and what was the effect if you're using a nasal mask versus a full face mask. And then the last thing they did was to put mouth tape across the patient. So the patients, even though they were wearing a full face mask, were only allowed to breathe through their nose uh, because of the tape. And what you'll see here in this patient, this is, again, a chronic oronasal mask user. On the oronasal mask, they're having recurrent obstructive sleep apnea events, pause in breathing versus airflow versus pause in breathing airflow. So repetitive events here. But when they were transitioned over to the nasal mask, you see that they were effectively able to open up the pressure and the pressure requirement that was required is, was lower than at the maximum full face mask that they needed to use here. So using a nasal mask transitioned this person to a, a stable nasal breathing. When you then look across the series of 13 patients that, that, that they studied here, you know, they noted a couple, several findings, you know, in this graph, 
They show you that the nasal pressure requirement was a few centimeters lower on average than when you use the full face mask. In addition, uh, what they notice is, is that, you know, as the amount of oral breathing increased, you know, the delta pressure difference between using a full face mask and a nasal mask would increase. Um, and then they also looked at, you know, what the effect of mouth tape versus no tape. And when you used a, a, a mouth tape, you can see that there's an equivalence in, in airflow between the nasal pressure and the full face mask condition versus there's very little ability to keep the airway open when you didn't use a, a, a tape under the full face mask here. So that just tells you that there's more resistance in the airway uh, using the full face mask versus when the patient's mouth is taped, they're able to lower the overall resistance. Um, so again, giving you that sense that you're more able to effectively treat these patients with a nasal mask, even though they might say that they're, they're chronic mouth breathers. This uh, slide just shows you what happens uh, in real time when you transition from a nasal mask and open up the compartment so that they can breathe through their nose and mouth. And what you'll see in the endoscopy images from this line, uh, the airway is open where it's much smaller over here. Concomitantly, airflow is much more, but appears to decrease. And there's much more effort that the patient's exerting just to try to keep their airway airway open. You know, some of the data that they show here that I won't go over in too much detail, basically showing that the airspace was larger with the nasal mask condition versus the full face mask condition. And so do patients who are adapted to an oral nasal mask breathe primarily through the nose or, or the mouth? And again, in this series of 13 patients, and what they really found was that even though these patients are prescribed the oral nasal mask because they think that they're, they're mouth breathers, at least during sleep, what they know is that 11 of the 12 patients were predominant nasal breathers, even though they were using a full face mask. You know, the, this study sort of goes to the concept of the chin, again, potentially being pushed uh, backwards, you know, by the full face mask. And this was a series of six patients that uh, were identified to have um, a high PAP pressure requirement. And what they did was they just looked at what the pressure requirement was with the full face mask condition. And you can see here the pressures were between 13 to 20 centimeters of water. But when they did the titration with the nasal mask, they found that the residual uh, uh, pressure was much, much lower. The patient was more likely to be able to be treated successfully. When they then took the patients, they then put an oral appliance in them to keep the mandible stable while they had the full face mask on. And you'll see that the pressure requirements under the full face mask condition are still high, but you were able to rescue some of these patients. So again, suggesting that the full face mask at times is pushing the chin backwards. So that's just something uh, 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 to keep in mind. So are there differences in pressure requirements? And so, you know, the next few slides just illustrate uh, that in fact, yes, you know, on average, when you look at the difference between nasal interfaces and full face mask, that the average pressure requirement is going to be higher. Um, in this particular case, these are patients that on a nasal mask, they had a lower residual sleep apnea rate compared to patients with an oronasal mask. And you'll see here that the pressure requirements on average tended to be about five centimeters higher on average using a full face mask compared to a, a, a nasal, nasal mask. Some of this may vary by the severity of sleep apnea. So when you have higher sleep apnea severity, the amount of pressure difference using a full face mask versus a nasal mask may be at its highest, meaning you'll need much higher pressures with the full face mask to control their sleep apnea compared to the nasal interface. This study just shows that, you know, when you're able to take a patient from a full face mask and switch them over to a nasal interface, generally speaking, the residual AHIs tended to be lower. 
and this was a, a randomized crossover over study that 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 was done. You know, so those are sort of in sort of selected uh, uh, cases, if you will, or control study conditions. What about in the real world environment? And so this is a study out of Australia where they looked at uh, uh, at the use of nasal interfaces and full face masks in their sleep laboratories. And what they tended to find was that you know, patients with higher PAP pressure requirements are more often given a full face mask, perhaps because we think that patients need it because of the higher pressure requirement. And so they looked at about you know, 400 sleep studies uh, you know, and about almost half of those patients were given a noronasal mask. You know, this group had, you know, severe sleep apnea. And what they did see was that on average that the oronasal mask, that the pressure requirements were slightly elevated by one to two centimeters of water. Uh, so not markedly so, but on average, it was a little bit higher. The AHI was higher. The residual AHI on the full face mask was at about 11 versus six or seven episodes uh, uh, per hour. And when they just sort of looked at sort of their prescription of full face mask, and they just looked at, well, is it people getting the highest pressures that are being given these full face masks? You know, their analysis seemed to verify their, their, their hypothesis that the majority of patients, you know, with PAP pressures greater than 15 were preferentially being given the full, full face mask. In France, you know, they have the ability to sort of retrospectively look, uh, you know, at, at large number of patients. And they looked at the, about 2,000 patients in this study that had a follow-up visit over up to a two-year period that had severe sleep apnea. And they noted a few things, which was that, you know, adherence tended to be about 30 to 60 minutes lower uh, with a full face mask compared to a nasal interface. And the pressure requirements, again, were noted to be more, more elevated. There also tended to be more side effects uh, using a full face interface versus a, a nasal interface in, in, in a real world setting. And that led these authors to, to conclude that the use of oronasal masks should be restricted to cases of documented nasal mask failures. So last area to touch on is, you know, what do we know about patient preference? And, you know, there's not a lot of data in this particular area, but this is one randomized control study that was done where patients were uh, first randomized to one mask, and then after a washout period, were then allowed to use the second mask. What they noticed was that the adherence tended to be higher with the nasal mask group by about an hour compared to when they were using the full face mask. The airport scores, uh, because they were using it a little bit more, tended to be better. There tended to be less side effects in terms of air leaks using the nasal interface compared to the full face interface. And when they were ultimately asked at the end of the study, well, which mask do you want to go home with? Uh, you know, patients ended up saying that they uh, primarily prefer the nasal mask interface compared to the full face mask interface in this case. Um, you know, there are some other studies that may suggest that, uh, you know, uh, nasal mask interfaces are sort of greater patient preference compared to full face masks. Uh, you know, when patients are given, given the option and offered the option, and so these are a few studies that that would would support that particular notion, you know. And so this is all to say that you know there are all of these pieces of evidence to suggest that on average we probably should be using nasal interfaces more than we probably do. That this has made its way into our clinical practice guidelines, and I'm just sort of selecting a, a you know a paragraph uh, you know out of the most recent PAP clinical guidelines published from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, you know, but effectively what it says here is, you know, these data suggest that for the routine initiation of PAP therapy in adults with OSA, clinicians should generally use nasal or intranasal mask interfaces over oronasal or oral interfaces. And so, you know, going back to this patient, you know, 
I said, well, you know, it's been a long time since you've had a sleep study. Why don't we sort of relook at things and let's do a split night sleep study on you and let's see how bad your sleep apnea is and then see what happens on a CPAP titration if we just use a nasal interface in this case. So you'll see based on the, during the diagnostic portion where I'm circling here, patient continue to have severe obstructive sleep apnea between 50 to 70 episodes uh, an hour. This is his CPAP titration table. He only required pressures between four and eight when he used the nasal interface. And his residual uh, AHI was about three episodes an hour at a CPAP pressure of eight, just using that nasal interface. And so in summary, what I'd say here, kind of looking at this is, you know, in some patients, oronasal mass can result in airway obstruction. So don't necessarily think that these interfaces are always equivalent. Um, they can lead to ineffective or incomplete resolution of the AHI. They can result in higher pressure requirements than the nasal interfaces. On average, or nasal masks are not preferred by patients because of mask leak and claustrophobia issues. And we shouldn't assume based on this that these are interchangeable with nasal interfaces. And we should be monitoring patients to, to see if they really do need to use the oronasal masks. So a general approach, I think, to maybe consider, you know, particularly during titration studies, is that a nasal interface really should be first-line therapy. Even if a patient says that they think they're a mouth breather, start with the nasal interface. You're going to have to do some counseling and coaching. There may be some apprehension, but once they can, you have to sort of coach them to learn to keep their mouth closed. And I think what patients are telling us more often than not is that they're uncomfortable with the back pressure and they open up their mouth. And because they open up their mouth, they get all the air leak out of their mouth. And then it's just a it's just a vicious spiral. And so we go to that oronasal mask. And so you want to just sort of walk the patient through using that nasal interface and educate them about what they should be expecting. And hopefully that'll get them to acclimate to using it while they're awake. Because once they're asleep, more often than not, they're going to be nasal breathers. Um, during PAP setups, you know, assess the tolerance to the nasal interface. Even if patients, you know, identify that they have difficulties breathing with the nasal interface, you know, try to go ahead and identify the problem and see if it can be addressed medically. So what are some of those things we can do? You know, have we optimized the heated humidification? You know, we know that, uh, you know, one of the reasons you mouth breathe is because of high nasal resistance. And we can reduce nasal resistance if we optimize heated humidification. So that's something to keep under consideration. Maybe it's the discomfort with the back pressure that we talked about. And so maybe using expiratory pressure relief or bilevel therapy could be something that's considered. Another thing is to consider if they have significant congestion, rhinorrhea, address the nose, right? So think about nasal washes, nasal steroids, um, you know, e even the atrovent nasal sprays can be used. And in some cases, you may need to send that patient to be seen by ENT, and maybe nasal surgery needs to be considered in order to optimize their ability to use a nasal interface. You know, if you have to use an oronasal mask, at least make sure you have a good fitting because this can be difficult from what you see in published research and just in the real, real world. And then more important than not is really this issue of, you know, trust but verify. You know, verify the effectiveness of the oronasal mask within a few weeks. PAP therapy is one of those few therapies we know what the residual AHI is because we can look at a PAP report and so look at the adherence data, ask if the bed partner's noting residual snoring when they use a full face mask or other observations that might clue you in to the fact that the full face mask is not working as well as you think it is. And that can let you uh, lead to maybe trying an interf nasal interface instead. So 
uh, you know, thank you for your time and attention. Hopefully this is a, uh, this was uh, educational and I, and I hope this is something you'll incorporate in your, in your practices and when you're doing sleep studies uh, uh, and uh, considering, you know, that nasal interface really is the, as the first uh first line treatment for, for, for patients rather than using a, a full face masks. Hello everyone. I'm Leo Nizzi with Medical Service Company, regional sales manager from the Eastern coast of our company. Um, I definitely think we have a great lineup of speakers here today. And we start off with a bang with Dr. Patil and what's in a mask. So Dr. Patil, thank you so much for joining us today. We have a load of questions for you. I'm sorry to everybody if we don't get through all of the questions, but we're sure gonna do our best, all right? Uh, you ready, Dr. Patil? Ready. Fire all right, first question for you is, do patients that use nasal masks have better compliance? Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. Uh, you know, so small studies seem to indicate when you do it in a randomized control setting that, yes, that that is the case, um, you know, but those are in more controlled settings. You know, the, if you look at uh, sort of real world data, um, you know, we also see uh, a similar finding that in general, people that are on nasal uh, masks tend to have less complaints than people with full face masks. Now, you know, I think you can look at that information uh, in a couple of different ways, which is, is that, you know, you know, just having to use a full face mask uh, the reason people might have more issues with it, you know, could be related to just not fitting well, but it, it just may also be a marker of somebody who has trouble with nasal breathing in general. And that's just a sign that you have to try to work with them to see what you can do to optimize their nasal breathing. Wonderful. Thank you for that answer. We certainly had that come up a couple of times in the chat. So it seems to be a hot button topic. Uh, second question for you is, would it be recommended then to use a full face mouth with mouth tape, full face mask, I'm, I'm sure that means with mouth tape, would there be a difference between using a chin strap or mouth tape? Yeah. So I personally would feel more cautious about putting mouth tape under a full face mask, right? Because now you have two barriers in case, uh, you know, something were to happen, like if the patient, you know, was nauseous, let's say, and, you know, or was having reflux issues. So, you know, really, if you're going to be using mouth tape, it would make more sense to me to be using a nasal interface anyway. Um, and so I, I just think from a safety standpoint, I wouldn't I wouldn't do a, a double tape. If you, you were worried about the, um, you know, the, the, the chin sort of dropping even with the full face mask, it might make sense to use a chin strap. Um, but you have to be careful with chin straps because uh, chin straps sometimes can be very helpful. It just sort of supports the, the chin and keeps the mouth closed. But other times, if you strap it too tight, it can actually push the chin backward and do the opposite of what you're trying to do, which is open the airway. Gotcha. Thank you for that. So a good follow-up question to that was, uh, do you have any suggestions of what to do if your patient's leak is high when using a nasal mask due to their mouth falling open? Yeah, you know, so I, I think the question there is, well, you know, how bad is the leak really, right? Just because there is a leak doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Not all leak is bad is something I, I like to say. Um, you know, leak is bad when it bothers and disrupts the patient. So, you know, certainly if you're having problems sort of in the midst of a sleep study, um, you know, being able to assess the airflow channel, you might need to do some intervention, um, you know, such as I would prefer using a chin strap in the lab or, you know, if, if, uh, if the patient is willing and the lab happens to have it, maybe using a little bit of lip tape. Um, you know, uh, before kind of using a full face mask, but if all bets are off, sometimes you kind of have to, have to, have to go, go to that, but it's just being aware of what the, what the pitfalls might, might be. Sure. A lot of patients, it just comes down to find the right way to make it work. Right. Um, so a little bit more of a pointed question at some of the studies is, did any of these studies specifically record spontaneous arousals with oral breathing when using nasal interface versus a full face mask? Yeah, great question. And no, not not that I know of. I don't know that they looked at just all arousals or non-respiratory arousals as, as one example. Um, but that would be an interesting question to sort of look at.
Sure. No, no. I, and I appreciate all the studies. I think that the conversation between full face mask and nasal mask is really heating up out in the, uh, in the clinical world these days. But uh, so one more question for you here as we get closer to the end of the time. Uh, maybe we'll have time for one more depending on the answer to this one. But what does a high leak do with the nasal mask when you are also using O2 bleed in with a pap? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question, right? You know, if, if the leaks are high, um, you know, the amount of oxygen that you're getting when you're when you're delivering it is, is sort of dependent on, you know, how much of the minute ventilation of the patient and how much entrained air might be diluting the oxygen being being delivered. So, you know, in the presence of, of, of high air leak, it, it is possible that the patient is not getting the oxygen concentration delivered that you think they should be getting. And as a result, in that setting, it might be necessary to compensate by increasing uh, the, the oxygen uh, 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 flow rate. Gotcha. Wonderful. So I think we do have time for one more question, if you don't mind. So for severe OSA, can you wear a oral device with a nasal or fa full face mask with a mouth breather, um, or should you try nasal first? So I, I'm going to assume w when the questioner is asking about oral device that they're talking about like an oral appliance or, or maybe a mouth guard for, for, for teeth grinding here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, in, in that case, again, I would still sort of push for using a nasal interface first. Again, you know, the amount of leak, you know, should be relatively small. And, you know, PAP devices can compensate for, 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 for you know, reasonable uh, 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 leaks. You know, if it's when it's large leaks and you're starting to notice that your your flow signal is is not optimal, that's when we start to start to worry about what what, what it's doing. Many patients, you know, when they uh, even though they may be doing a, a little bit of a oral breathing, they may be doing both nasal and oral breathing. Um, you know, and that's what some of the studies I tried to present uh, in in the presentation were were, were showing. Um, and so to the extent that you appreciate that, I think, you know, it's still all right to try the nasal, nasal uh, interface first. Wonderful. Well, thank you for your answer to the questions, Dr. Patil. Uh, there's no doubt that a lot of people really enjoyed your presentation. We didn't even get through probably half of the questions uh, that came through the chat. So definitely a great start to the day. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your dedication to your patients and medical service company. And I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. So thank you and have a wonderful day. Likewise. Thanks so much for, for having me speak. Wonderful. Take care. Take care. Bye.